Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to EIG 76 webinar, a fireside chat discussion with our guest experts from the industry, coursework, founder and director of For Excellence Solutions, and Monica Opkamp from a management uh, consultant at For Excellence Solutions. Uh, we look forward to an interactive webinar with each and every one of you. Uh, please do uh, enter and, and be active in the webinar. Also, we also please keep in mind that we always hope that your family is healthy and safe. Again, this is the 75th uh, webinar, and it's in a series of webinars on supply chain visibility series and overall series and how to make risk management part of your everyday life. Uh, we'll be sharing at least three best practices, if not more, mm -hmm. during this webinar, and we always like to see interactive questions. Um, we espouse, and EIG espouses people process data technology. We're gonna see how we can use risk management and use uh, SaaS type solutions to help us in risk management. So this is a pretty cool offering that For Excellence has provided and is providing, and we look forward to uh, sharing that with you. My name is Jim DeVries. I am founder and president of Enhance International Group. We're exchange of experts to guide your transformation, to provide self-generating and self-funding results. We have over 50 consultants, consulting companies, and SaaS providers throughout the world that have been vetted as best in class. EIG serves as that master integrator, and uh, we're like a Swiss army knife. Our, P our team is dedicated to empowering your organization's workforce by leveraging our EIG's tenured thought leadership expertise. Our goal is to meet or exceed your expectations in customized, predictable, sustainable, and repeatable 90-day self-funding programs. Uh, today's webinar is free and will be uh, placed on the EIG webpage, consultingeig.com, after the webinar. Also, we will be sending out the slides to all the registrants. Today, we are fortunate to have two highly respected leaders in this field of risk management, Cor Schwart and Monica Aka. Uh, Cor is from, as I mentioned before, is the president of For Excellence. Cor, a few words of introduction. Yes, thanks, Jim. And really thank you for this opportunity to join you and EIG. And we are really excited about this partnership with you. Yeah, just something about myself. I worked in the petrochemical industry for 10 years. So um, I started my career in strategic sourcing. So putting a lot of um, sourcing contracts in place, doing spend analysis and work like that. Um, later, I moved to um, the carbon supply chain world where I managed uh, outbound supply chain for international business. And then later on, I moved into a business intelligence function. Um, and then we progressed into all strategy management, developing long-term strategies for companies. And um, then about 10 years ago, we started our management consulting business. And that's really where a lot of the, the risk management work then also started, but already with the previous experience, we we started with that. So yeah, that's a, just a quick introduction about myself. Thanks, Cora. Monica? Hi, guys. I'm Monica Ockham. I work with Cora. I'm a management consultant for 4 Solutions, and I am an industrial engineer by qualification. But I love working on innovative ideas and complex concepts and understanding them and communicating them to you guys and to everyone to really make a difference in the world and in your business. So yeah, I'm very excited to present both of to you today. And I'm excited and interested to see the conversations that will follow and come out of this. So very happy and excited. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Cor. Uh, very excited to have you here. This is a, a great topic. Uh, I heard we're having technical problems. Hopefully the chat is now active. If not, use the Q&A box for your questions and comments. Uh, just a little bit of my background for the last 30 years. 
Uh, I've served as a resilient executive leader for startups Fortune four to Fortune 500s. I've worked to identify risk uh, and prioritize them and deliver high return on investment, sustainable improvements, uh, generating self-funding results. I've held leadership uh, positions in sales, marketing, supply chain, finance, reporting, uh, more of a generalist overall. And I started my career in the 80s under Jack Welch at General Electric. Uh, my technical background is uh, uh, physics and mechanical and electrical engineering. Uh, our teams uh, have developed a resilient enterprise uh, ecosystems. Once you have one up, it's so exciting to see how much a difference it can make in your company. So I'm very excited about today's uh, discussion. With that, uh, turn it over to Core to give an introduction of, of the four, four excellent solutions. Core? Yeah, so as I said, and what Monica now said in her introduction, our team is mostly industrial engineers. So we come from a very strong continuous improvement background. So all of the team has that sort of expertise. And where we started off was doing a lot of management consulting work, specifically in operational risk management and business excellence solutions. And then out of that grew the software enablement. So that's why we started developing the software that we'll also show a bit later. And then also the e-learning component, because you, you after you've developed a strategy and you give people the tools, you also then want to enable them and with the, the practical learning material to embed it in the business. So it's really a combination of this end-to-end -end solutions. Thanks, Cor. Pretty cool what you built here. So I will give you a little bit of background about EIG. Uh, again, uh, we're the 50 consultants, consulting companies, and SaaS providers. And I act as a, our, our EIG acts as that master integrator to uh, provide the, the one-stop shop solution for our customers. In uh, describing uh, supply chain risk management, I love the bicycle slide. Uh, we're gonna start by recognizing that the supply chain is an ecosystem as we've discussed. Uh, you might've heard the saying that we're only as, as strong as our weakest link. And this shows it here with the drive chain. Uh, you can look at the strategy as a as a drive wheel. The tactics is the chain, and the execution, of course, is getting you going where you need to be going. A strongly linked strategy to ex execution ecosystem creates positive momentum for the company, its employees, customers, suppliers, and shareholders. Quoting Albert Einstein, "Life is like a bicycle. To keep your balance, you need to keep on moving. So we're going to keep moving." And on to the uh, survey here. Thanks for entering uh, into the survey. Looks like we got some folks from manufacturing, uh, consulting, healthcare, management. Uh, a nice, a nice, a nice uh, mix of folks. And uh, so, uh, Core and Monica, any comments on on the industries that you you've uh, worked in recently? Yeah, we actually in last year did some work in the healthcare industry for a, um, a big hospital group in South Africa. And then, yeah, we've we've done a lot of work actually in the mining industry. So that's not a traditional manufacturing environment, but then also for big, the petrochemical companies we've worked for. And then a lot of logistics work for um, big logistics service providers. So more on the supply chain space. Monica? Want yeah, to add? I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, and you will see later in this webinar, we do refer to the mining industry. We've been um, present in South Africa there. So yeah, I'm excited to share that as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we'll get moving here. Again, welcome everyone. Uh, we look to cover uh, all industries and what's nice about this tool, it applies to all industries. Yeah. So with that, uh, we'll kick it off. Uh, this will be the first of a series of webinars on enabling your workforce to proactively manage risks. And again, this is getting us starting with putting a bow tie on risk management today. And then next year we'll be focused on uh, more webinars in this area. 
and and doing some live case studies coming up in March. So with that, uh, the agenda today is uh, starts off with what is risk management, the risk management process, and how to manage risk with the bowtie methodology, and a case study on certain on certain events. Pretty cool. And then the value proposition. So uh, with that, I think we'll just get started on what is risk management. And, you know, risk is, I, I like to say risk is a four letter word that people are often too afraid of. Uh, risk is something that should be embraced versus avoided at all costs. Uh, companies that have embraced risk, uh, you know, have an opportunity are the companies that are resilient and for the and uh, they are the ones that are focused on turning risk opportunities into into uh, really uh, pretty cool ways of differentiating yourself in the marketplace. So kicking it off with risk, risk can be defined as the probability of a future event that could positively or negatively impact the achievement of our objectives. Uh, of course, our objective is to win the game, right? As we always, but on a six-sided uh, dice to win the game, you know, you can only, you roll the dice once and your odds are, what's your probability? 17% chance of a positive impact. So in summary, we live in a world of probabilities and chances to gain desired outcomes. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we can't control our outcomes from events? Of course, as we always say, it depends, but the answer is yes and no. And uh, so let's investigate some more. Uh, the risk management process to manage uncertainty. What is it and what is risk management? This helps manage uncertainties on two fronts, uh, reduces the probability and mitigates the impact of an unwanted event, or you can increase the probability and utilize the opportunity for a wanted event. So again, there's it's always two two-sided coins. So what is the probability of a risk event occurring today and impacting business outcomes? A little bit on risk. So what is what is McKinsey and and all those uh, uh, consult big big house consulting companies talk about risk? Well, in 2021, McKinsey put out and summarized disruptions in a, from a few different perspectives, uh, from left to right. The first uncertainty has has grown many times since 2000. We can see that the uncertainty has moved up, and uh, we live in an ever more interconnected ecosystem with the explosion of global trade and China getting in the mix. So you can see from 1990, when China started coming in to the mix, the volatility of the world actually has uh, increased. From a geopolitical perspective, we had a peak in 2003. Of course, that was the Gulf War and uh, the invasion of Iraq. And then in the third graph here um, uh, is the cyber in Incidents, not surprisingly, has risen uh, 24 percentage uh, points since 2013 to 2021, and it's. I think it just keeps going up. I just did a, a, a webinar on cybers, and it's just escalating because there is a war between behind the curtain, so to speak, or behind the firewall of be, between all countries today. And then the fourth is the natural disasters. We are seeing an increase in natural disasters or the impact of natural disasters. And the question is, are, are the natural disasters increasing or the impact of those increasing? But nevertheless, it is costing us a lot of uh, personal strife. In summary, McKinsey makes the point, disruptions are becoming more frequent and more severe as global populations increases. Our cities are getting larger with old infrastructure, pushing our limits over the original design to gain more at lower cost. So the question that is out there is, are we at a tipping point? And are we pushing ourselves? And should we be spending more on infrastructure? You hear that all the time. Uh, this is a, another McKinsey or busy slide, but it's very, very informative. And it looks at the disruptions that occur regularly. And the magnitude of the estimated shock is on the y-axis here from low to high, the ability to anticipate the lead time 
uh, is from less to more. So here in the upper right quadrant is foreseeable catastrophes. On the left side is the unantic unanticipated catastrophes, as we call them. In the bottom right quadrant is the foreseeable disruptions, and the bottom left is the unanticipated disruptions. So we can all remember when we were there, you know, at the last financial crisis, where were you? Where were you when a hurricane hit? Uh, where, where were you when there was a, a military conflict of some type? Of course, the pandemic, where were you? <laughs> and what were you doing or not doing that you wanted to do during our uh, the, the COVID pandemic is up here in the upper right, causing trillions and trillions of dollars. So that this gives you an, an, uh, an overall view of how we look at risks. And uh, the underlying questions, are we prepared? And whoever can prepare quicker than your nearest competitor will gain your unfair market share. So we wanna be, we all wanna be the ones who can gain that unfair market share. So that gets us to how do we be uh, more proactive in risk management? We want to create or control an event rather than just responding to it after it happened. So uh, we've broken this out into two categories, certain and uncertain. The certain perspective creates controls so that the response plans are embedded in the way that they work. Uh, so in the way that you work every day, do you have awareness of the known and unknown risks? And do you have do, do we have and use our knowledge to proactively uh, manage known risks? Then from an uncertain perspective, we wanna build flags and response plans. And of course here you have unknown unknowns that uh, you are always worried, are you ignorant of these? And, and of course the unknown knowns, do you have blind spots caused by hidden facts and risks? So the question is, uh, you know, having controls, do you have the controls and the visibility alerts to help you uh, plan ahead of time? And then, of course, that is imperative to drive stability in your workplace, especially as the world gets smaller and smaller and more interconnected and complex. So that's what risk management is all about is all those different perspectives. So let's look at how does this apply in your business? It could be anything from the, the knowns, the certain things, you know, you have a, a chemical warehouse in your in your facility and there's a, a risk of a loss of containment and it, it's going to happen. And are you prepared? You don't want to be in the situation where you have chemical burns. You want to have no harm type of situations. So have you built your contingency plans? Have you have you have you built all your mediation and training? to mediate or eliminate the likelihood of that to occur. So those are certain knowns. The uncertain unknowns, of course, are COVID and the Ukraine war. Those types of things are out there and planning for those events requires uh, a lot more of a, an action plan, so remediation plan in case of a COVID event, in case of these events, what are you going to do? So BCP, business continuity planning, and using the bow tie method are the things that are going to help you out in those. And we'll share those uh, a little bit later. So with, with that, we'd like to open it up to another polling question that says, what, what uh, significant risk events that have occurred in your business in the past year? Is it, uh, so please do enter in the, uh, in the uh, survey and or enter it in the chat box and we'll enter it in for you. So with that, bring Cora and Monica back up and ask them for their thoughts on uh, dis different risk events that they've been seeing out there. Core. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I think for us, one of the big things is there's been a lot of supply chain disruption that we saw actually past COVID. And in the last year, some of that actually continued and it took actually quite some time for that to stabilize. The other thing was the war in Ukraine that you now mentioned there above. I think there was a huge increase in fuel prices that we actually saw 
um, on our side. So, I mean, the, it, it became quite ridiculous what you have to pay from a logistical point of view to move um, stuff around. So I think that that was one of the big things we saw. Actually, something that doesn't necessarily happen in South Africa, but the knock-on effect that we saw on our side. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that was one of the big things. So Monica, if you want to add on that. Yeah, no, I think um, we we had a few risks that we had to deal with. Um, and But I think we, we see it more in our consulting or our clients where we need to deal with short shortages. I think that was a big one. And here in South Africa, and we're going to talk about that as well, um, load shedding, something like where you just don't have power to produce and need to plan around that. Um, yeah, and typical markets and prices and events that influence that um, as well. Yeah, uh, that's what we've seen. We've seen a 10 to 20% rise in price and shortages mm -hmm. and things that we had never seen before is what my clients have been seeing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, one day it's, you know, it's not, it, it keeps changing and revolving where there's, we're short of a, a particular item and then it comes in and then six months later, we're short again on that item. And, and that volatility that keeps happening where you think you're all right with something. And now the challenge we have is that we're, we're not able to do proactive manufacturing. It's reactive manufacturing mm -hmm. where you're waiting for the materials to come in and whatever comes in, you're going to, you're going to create. Meanwhile, your factory is not running at its capacity. So you're losing money and and customers are getting impatient in and in, in gaining those and meanwhile your costs are going up you want to transfer those costs to your customers if you do do that then they may leave to somebody else who's more hungry than you are because everybody's hungry for customers now because most factories aren't running at full capacity no you're all right um, so I that's what i'm saying but uh everyone thanks for filling up the the world it looks pretty or not pretty it looks pretty full <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh unfortunately we're going to be going through a lot of volatility over these next you know 12 to 18 months everybody uh, some people may think it's it's over but it's it's not over and and now of course recession the big r word is mm -hmm. what everybody's fearing that we're going to go into in a recession so uh but uh if you are quicker than your nearest competitor, you're going to come out of this recession very strong. All right. With that, we'll move on to the risk management uh, process, and Cora will take us through this. Cora? Yes. Yeah, so thanks, Jim. I think what's important, as I said in the beginning, we do most of our work from a continuous improvement perspective. So what we've done is we've linked the typical risk management process just to the simple plan to check act improvement cycle. And what most of you that know risk management very good will see, it's actually also aligned to your typical ISO 31000 process. So we usually we will start to identify the context and understand all the risks. So that will be the first step where you usually start. So as all of you now listed above, I mean, there's a lot of risk that's part of your business. So after you've identified it, the next thing is to actually to go and understand that risk a lot better. So that's typical where you do your detailed risk assessments and analysis of those risks and try and understand um, what's the controls that you must put in place. The third step that you will usually then do is to actively manage those risks. So that's where why we say it's actually a do thing. It's, it's not only um, typical where most of people spend their time is in step one and two to actually understand the risk, but then they don't go manage it. But for us, management is like the, the active verification of the controls that you've put in place, all the plans that you've put in place, that that is actually working. And if you are doing that, then you must actually start looking at giving assurance that you are actually um, 
can give assurance to your board and all your stakeholders that those controls that you've put in place is actually doing what they are supposed to do. And if you've done that, then you must start looking at how can I improve that different control. So a lot of the methodology that, that we are proclaiming is actually to say, but it's not only understanding the risk, but also improving um, the different controls that you've identified through this process. So this we'll see is actually an iterative process um, that you'll do continuously. So to make it practical, what we've done is to use a funnel as an example. So typical, when you start out, you'll have a lot of different risks. And if you do start, say, on an enterprise risk management level, I mean, there's external and internal risk to your business. And um, like you guys that talk now about the manufacturing, I mean, there's typical risk now on, on the manufacturing process that you need to manage, but there's also external risk or supply risk or on the customer side as well. So the first thing that we usually do is um, we will, as we said, identify all those risks. So we will typically map out all the different business processes and then we'll build a prevalence map of those risks. So say typically, if you have a risk, risk, risk breakdown structure to say, okay, but for these different processes, where can I actually go and see that risk where it's prevalent? And then the next step, what you'll typically do is you'll go and assess that risk. So I think that's why the, the intro that Jim did was so important, because now you start looking at the probability of that event happening and then also the consequence or impact of that event. And for that, you'll typically use something like a five by five risk matrix where you can start seeing, okay, but these are my highest risk. So if you put it all through that funnel, now I've identified my top risks and that's only then when you'll start doing to assess um, and use the bow tie methodology. So the bow tie methodology, you won't usually start there at the top. You will first prioritize the risk and then if you understand that, you will go and do a detailed control analysis with a typical um, um, risk assessment tool. And so in this case, we will use the bow tie methodology to go and do it. So I think that the big thing is the bow tie isn't a traditional um, risk assessment tool in the sense like people that, that I'm not sure what tools you use, but typical your say baseline risk assessment where you look at all the different risks that's part of your business. So if you use the analogy from you have this helicopter view where you look at everything as you then actually drill down like this funnel, then you will focus on the top risk because now I actually go into a lot more detail analysis of the controls. So I, I have to comment here, uh, Cor, because I've done it manually many, many times, yes. countless times. And, you know, it's, it's some form of an FMEA. I've created what I'd call a control FMEA in different versions, but it's all manual. And yeah, yeah. coming out of it, you they always say, can you produce a heat map? And you're like, oh, my God, how am I going to do that in Excel? Yeah, yeah. This tool is beautiful because you're capturing it. It's all captured electronically. And, and then you have a heat map coming out of it like that, a snap of the fingers. So it's yeah. it's a beautiful thing. So, it's, so it's Jim, music, to my, that, music to my ears. Yeah. Here. And that's exactly where we started. We actually started originally building it on a whiteboard for our clients. So you would draw it on a whiteboard and then we built an Excel tool to make it available easily. But the problem is with the Excel tools, you are very limited in the functionality. Yeah. Very and then actually out of that learning, we then developed this tool. So yeah, it took us quite a while, but as you say, it's really to visualize those risks um, and specifically the controls related to that risk. So I think Monica will share a bit more about the, the methodology and how you use it. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's, yeah we're, we're stealing our thunder. So yes, Monica, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Okay. Yes, let me tell you how this works. So in essence, we call it a bow tie. And as you mentioned, Jim, it's really because it looks like a little bow tie. Um, but I just want to reiterate, you will not do this analysis on all of your risks. You will really drill down to your top risks and only apply this methodology to your top 10 or 20, 30, whichever you want risks to really understand them. 
So just explain the boat a bit in the middle. You've got your unwanted event. So that's the event you do not want to have happen or have it occur. Then on the left-hand side, you've got your threat. So that is everything that can cause the unwanted event to happen. And then in between the threat and unwanted event, you've got your preventive controls. So those are the controls that would reduce the, um, reduce the likelihood that they would happen. So um, then on the other side, you've got your consequences. So what would happen should the unwanted events happen? And same thing, in between your unwanted events and your consequences, you would sit with corrective controls. And you really want to mitigate the impact should your consequence happen by having controls in between the unwanted event and the consequence. Um, but the true um, uh, advantage or um, uh, benefit from using that the bow time methodology is that you can actually have a proactive mindset. So if you focus on the preventive controls, you can actually prevent the unwanted event from happening. So putting uh, for each thread line a line of controls in place that would prevent your unwanted event from happening. So we, um, a lot of us usually actually focus on the consequence. So if a unwanted event happens, we want to mitigate it somehow, but we want to shift the focus to actually go to the preventive control. It's far better to prevent um, the un un unwanted event from happening. Um, it's a very visual tool, so you can actually see your thread, you can see the consequence, you can see the unwanted event in the middle, and you can actually see the controls that you will put in place. And then you can go ahead and highlight the critical controls. So which of these controls are critical to preventing the unwanted event and or mitigating the um, consequences of the unwanted event? Um, so yeah, then you can also understand your effectiveness of these controls. So effectiveness is actually um, how effective is uh, um, control that you have, or is it effective? Will it prevent the unwanted event if it happens? And is it in place? Can you audit it? Is there a checklist? Is there somehow um, that you can um, understand its effectiveness? Just the last thing, um, it, there's a whole um, theory behind effectiveness as well, and we'll not go into that as well, but you're, there's, there's different ways to classify the effectiveness as well. And there's, there's a, a, question, from, there's a yeah. question about yeah. uh, uh, from a, someone in our audience on how do you define a critical control? Yes, so I'd like to answer that. So typical, the critical controls are the most important control. So you, it's, if you use the 8020 principle, if you now do very large bow ties, you'll see there's really a lot of controls that you identify, but then typical what you want to do is you want to identify those controls that must be managed very carefully in your business. And then usually we, we have a whole same methodology that you go through to go and determine those three or four controls. What if let's say in a safety environment, we usually use this principle that, I mean, that's the control that if that control fails, it will be too dangerous, for instance, to continue with that work. But for different aspects in your business, you will go and define that differently, but that's a very practical way to go and do it. So for instance, what we usually, just to explain it sim in a simple way, so if you drive your car and the wipers isn't working and it's not raining, some people will still drive their car. I'm not sure, Jim, in the US how it works, but in <laughs> South Africa, the people will drive. But if your brakes are not working, then that's actually a critical control. You will not drive the car. So that's a very simple explanation. But what you usually do is if you start looking at the different threat lines and consequence lines, you will start looking at things like, okay, is that control on multiple threat lines? So is it something that will help you in multiple cases? Um, so yeah, we can actually do a whole course just on that to talk a bit <laughs> about control criticality, but that's a very good question because yeah. I think that the problem is there's so many things that managers must manage. So I mean, there's yeah. so many different 
aspect. So what, what's nice about this, it's not about the bow tie that you built. It's the process that you take the management team through yeah. that they can identify those three or four really critical controls. Think, so, yeah. yeah. What you just said, the management team being involved is hypercritical because... Yes, that's exactly. It, so, it, so you so can't the, do this in a closet and no, then present it to the management team. They have to the, do it themselves. And I think that for me is the big value. It's more thinking framework than the tool. We build the tool just to help you with this process. But the value of this is having the management conversation. And what yeah. we've done in the past, we actually forced the people a bit to say, okay, but get to your top 20. Now you get three controls for each top 20. Now you yeah. already had 60 controls to manage. So right. what we would do is we would say, okay, but what's this critical controls? And you can call okay. it whatever you want. But yeah, I think. Yeah, I think we can take yeah. a lot of questions, but I think we better get yeah, moving yeah. here. I agree. So yeah. I'll, I'll hand it back to Monica. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> when yeah. controls fail, go Monica. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, especially in the mining industry where we do a lot of work, we do see the the repeat incidents, so uh, incident repeating itself. And then an easy way to prevent um, repeat incidents is to have to understand which control is failing, and they or even which threat line, so which um, line of controls is failing. And if you think about the Swiss um, cheese model with the holes. Um, the, the scenario might occur where there's a whole line of events that or controls that fail that will lead to a, the unwanted event. So yeah, I think um, if you can identify the, the problem or the control that is failing, you can reduce the repeat incidents that occur sometimes. Thanks, Monica. Okay. And uh, with that, we'll go to the next section. I know that somebody raised their hand and we appreciate that. If you could type it, your question in the chat, that would be great. Uh, and if, at the end, we'll, maybe we'll circle back if we have some time. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll move to the next section, Monica. Okay, so in South Africa, we have a unique situation where we do not have our <laughs> electricity. And it really affects all of us. It affects our businesses. It affects our personal lives. Um, we can't cook when it's load shedding because we don't have any electricity. Um, and the problem is our electricity is controlled or regulated by one entity. It's a state controlled entity. And they actually supply electricity to the entire South Africa. But we have experienced about 3,000 hours of power cuts this year up to date. And it's about 120 days where we do not have power. And um, we are a very innovative and fast thinking country for some of us, but it's really been affecting us where we can't produce or we can't put out um, the production that we need to due to low chili. So we decided to build a bow tie around this, just to explain the bow tie concept um, to you guys as well. So the hazard is, or the, the item that we want to control is actually a supply of electricity. The unwanted event, the event that we don't want is load shedding. So if we then try to understand the threats to our power supply, it is when we have breakdowns in the power plant, when we have um, supply constraints, or it's a really a regulatory landscape. So that's our threats. But a lot of this is not in our control as it is a state-owned or regulated environment. We don't have real control um, over it. So um, if, we, if we put preventive controls in place, it would be um, things that the power supplier can do to prevent load shedding. So if they plant, we don't want the plant to break down so they can have better security or they, most of our plants are coal, um, we generate electricity with coal, so if we increase the quality, we can generate more electricity, uh, maybe a better maintenance strategy, um, increase the skills. Um, so there's a number of controls that we can try and put in place as to prevent the load shedding from happening. I just need to say this is really a small extract from a larger bow tie that we did on this. So. Um, we just took a few just to explain the concept. Now on the corrective side, 
we actually have laws of production because we can't produce. Um, electricity that goes on and off uh, affects our equipment and it damages equipment. And we have a loss of productivity, a personal productivity, um, because you cannot work um, without the PC and equipment running. And then the mitigating, we, um, the creative control to mitigate this that we put in place is we in South Africa have a little app. <laughs> and on there, we can actually see when um, load shedding would occur. And we plan our days according to that. And um, yeah, so there is the entire bow tie um, in place with more um, controls and all the threads and consequences. It's very small, but it's just to illustrate that we really need to extract from the bigger picture of a bow tie regarding this. Excellent. Pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. Yeah, so I think what we tried to do, Jim, was just to illustrate how you can use the thinking. Um, so that was now a certain event. So in South Africa, load shedding has become certain. I mean, it's just you don't know when it will happen. But then for uncertain events, this was for me a very nice article just that just indicated typical um, how you will react to all this disruption and uncertainty. And what I liked a lot about... Um, about these different stages. If you look at the prepare one, that will now be actually very nicely applied to a supply chain environment where you see this, it says build buffers, etc. But what I liked or that resonated with me was that middle two, two parts that says you must sense early and then you must plan ahead. And that really talks a bit about that if you if you sense that something is happening, then you must start doing scenarios and you must prepare yourself um, from a thinking framework to be able to deal with that event. And then the last column, actually, where you, you see the propel, it says that disaster um, management or nerve center that you must put up. So the, the uncertain event, because we actually did the, a big project with this was um, for COVID-19. Um, we actually set up for a very large uh, mining company in South Africa um, that have over 30,000 employees. We had to manage this whole lockdown event in South Africa. So um, everybody, I think around the world, there were different responses. And you actually, you on, I think it was slide 12 that you showed about the pandemic that was there in the top um, right-hand corner where you said you have about, what's it, a month to prepare. I think we probably had about two to three weeks when we really got aware of the problem and that there will be a lockdown. And then you actually had to manage this for this organization. So the one big thing I think that 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 they did very well was to establish a COVID-19 response team very quickly to manage everything. And I think you said it earlier, you also need to have management involvement and the right team. So what we did is we got the CIO, the executive for she health etc you see all the names here on the slide but there was a core team that actually met every day to manage this whole situation and in addition to that we actually had ad hoc um, the business intelligence and financial people involved and also a psychologist because with all the anxiety that were happening you actually wanted somebody to to manage that. Um, so the bow tie that we did, you will see again, like the previous one that Monica showed, is um, the unwanted event in this case is now the lockdown. But before that, you had multiple events. So the one thing that the government, I think, tried to do was to actually flatten the curve a bit, the whole COVID um, curve, so that you um, they didn't have this failure of medical infrastructure. So I haven't built a bow tie for that. This is now more from a, a company perspective of what we did. So what was very important was the interaction with government and labor, um, and that you actually interact with them and consult. And it was talking to the medical guys. But then I think this whole thing about preparing was very important. So... As I already said, we put that response team in place. 
Um, then we put the emergency control center. We did the whole disaster management room. So we actually got the disaster management expert to help us set that up. And then we did a lot of scenario planning. We actually did it for every operation. So all 23, we would have sessions and say, I mean, if we're going to lockdown, how will that improve? And then we created a lot of data visibility with the dashboard. So that all of that happened actually before um, we went into lockdown. But then you will see, I mean, it was inevitable then to mitigate it that middle one, the infrastructure at risk leading to mine closure. So I'm a bit dif different from typical manufacturing. You cannot just close down a mine. So you actually need to have a phased approach and decide, um, yeah, you must keep the ventilation and a lot of those things running. So um, you had to identify these essential and non-essential services and employees. And then what complicated it a lot is the government actually said all the people must go home. So <laughs> the lockdown meant that a lot of the foreign nationals working in South Africa, you had to have a system to get them home. And you will see there, um, that was actually quite a huge issue. Yeah, so that, if you just go, I think, to the next one, I think, sorry, yeah, the one about... The, um, the whole boat, I, I think that's just still the load shedding one. But if you look at the whole, um, uh, we've somehow yeah, the one time. on the on the lockdown, I think that one, I mean, there was a lot of different things that you had to do to actually manage that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I think I can talk the whole day about that. But I think yeah. what I wanted to illustrate is really the response that you need for these different events. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you said, you know, the scenario planning, going through the scenarios and making sure everybody knows what they should be doing yes. and assigning roles in a line of authority, right, of how decisions are going to be made very often. It's much different than a day-to-day -day operational decision. Yes is much different than a risk of that type of decision. And you need different techniques to do those, uh, take those actions. And that's what a lot of folks don't realize. They say, well, I run a factory, I know how to make decisions. No, but these are different types of decisions affecting people differently. And the human factor is any change that abrupts a person, right? Any change that you know, you're not used to or you're not warned about, is abrupt if everybody's warned and and everybody's part of if this happens and that's communicated then everybody goes in the mode of execution you get over that change piece that everybody's going to go through ahead of time by doing this scenario planning so very powerful technique yes. uh, yes, with so that uh, we'll move on to the value proposition is that okay any other closing yes, comments on that section core no, I think I think what was just important was although you, again you had very little control over the preventive controls, it helped you in terms of the thinking to prepare for these uncertain events. And I think that's the value for me of the methodology. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So with that, we'll go in our closing section on the value proposition of of performing bow tie. Um, again. Uh, Core made a big point about this, uh, you know, to be able to, on uncertain events, being able to bounce back and of certain events, how to prevent them or more uh, have everybody attuned to being able to manage those proactively. And, you know, where will you see benefits for this? So we talked a lot about that internally here and we talked, well, certainly from a cost reduction perspective, you're going to gain uh, gain uh, some some uh, benefits. Interesting enough, when you have these controls in place, your insurance premiums actually decrease because there's less risk from that perspective. So actually informing them that you have a, a bow tie methodology, uh, business continuity plan set up in case of events happen will actually reduce your insurance uh, premiums. The second area is your automated workflow. Uh, you know, as uh, Core had mentioned, you know, uh, that is certainly going to have a, a very positive impact. And of course, when you are 
employing operational excellence, hyper automation, uh, automation and optimizations processes, you're going to get more throughput through your when you're when you are running, you're actually going to run better. So that will help you from a cost reduction perspective with these controls because people will know what to do and when. From a cost avoidance perspective, the second major area, you know, there's a 17% increase in effectiveness and risk detection and uh, assessment from a year over year perspective, 7% higher than other competitors. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of benefit there. From a cost avoidance perspective, you also see a, a reduction in cost. And uh, these are cost avoidance is always a, I would say, a discussion point is like, is that real savings? If it never happened, it, it does save over time. And we've saved, going back to my days in the, at GE in the 90s, we saved a tremendous amount of money on cost avoidance by proactively managing risk events. And, and it really helped us be much more nimble in the marketplace. Uh, the uh, resilient companies that did it better on the onset after the recession of two, 2007, if you remember that financial crisis, the housing crisis is often called, the, the companies that perform these practices came out much, much stronger and outperformed the S&P 500. And those are those top five to 10% of the companies out there are the ones that are, are have built that resilient enterprise. So, uh, which we espouse. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Core to wrap it up here. Yeah, so perhaps just on that previous slide, what was interesting, that slide where you see the bounce, the resilient companies that do better, that, that example that I showed you about the lockdown in South Africa, I mean, the company that we worked for, because we could, we were able to actually manage that whole lockdown, I think, very efficiently. Um, they actually, the, the year after the, the period after the lockdown, they were actually making rec record profits because you were actually able to capitalize on the high gold price. So, nice. but if you, if you didn't respond appropriately and it took you too long, and I mean, you actually damaged the infrastructure, et cetera, you, you wouldn't have been able to capitalize on that. So I think that's the importance of, of this mindset. Um, yeah, excellent point. If, if I can add to that, I think when um, the other mines were not producing or struggling to get started again, that mine was actually again producing because they managed to get their people back with permits and everything um, quicker than the other mines to start up again um, after the event. So, yeah, um, and it was part of their response plan. Yeah. Okay. All right. With that, I think we're going to keep moving. In the, yes. And in the interest of time, if I can. Yeah, so I think what we just wanted to say, I mean, we've developed this bow tie tool. So the examples you saw, the more detailed examples were built in this tool. And it's really a nice visualization tool. Um, and there's also training material that's available because if you start doing a lot of, say, more operational risk, work, then you need to go a bit more into the theory. So we didn't try and cover any of that today, but if somebody's interested in that thing, um, they can go and have a look at that um, online training material. Very good. Yeah, this is just a summary, Jim, of really how it helps you in terms of the, we already said it, the visual risk communication, how you understand. And I think the other thing, it's really applicable to different industries, although it's traditionally applied a lot in the mining industry. I really think you can use the logic in any case where you want to become more proactive in your risk management. Yeah, and then, yeah, that's just our contact details. If somebody wants to, to be in contact with us or need more information on anything that we share, then they can just contact us. Okay. With that, I think we'll close out. If there's any other questions, um, 
Um, I know Mark asked a question about the 17% benefit yeah. risk detection and assessment. Do you want to take that on, Core? That question? Yeah, yeah, I just think the more the more you are able to be aware of the risk that, that your company faces, then I cannot tell you exactly how that 17% were calculated, but <laughs> yeah. you will you will become I mean, you will be able to actually avoid a lot of those risks um, and then the cost associated with that. And I think that's the important principle. Um, and that figure will probably be different for the type of company and the type of risk you are facing. Um, because a lot of it, sometimes you can go and relate, for instance, to downtime in your business. Yeah, um, I think yeah, I, th that the downtime is. I, I have to add on there. That's how we did it. Is is yeah, we yeah. got used to saying we never knew exactly how much it costs us a day to be down for a line to be down, yeah, for a day or a minute or an hour. Having those metrics clear to everyone to say, well, if this line's down, we lose a hundred dollars an hour. Yeah. On this line, it costs us a thousand dollars a line because we're running these type of products. Mm -hmm. So, just having that as part of your vocabulary and everybody's speaking in that language across the board creates a sense of urgency across mm -hmm. your all, all the folks, so they know where to prioritize. Most of the time, all the priorities are are in upper management, and it doesn't transcend. And it's not empowering the organization. And then upper management says, why don't people know? Well, quite honestly, you haven't given the tools to let them know. And mm -hmm. this is a fantastic tool to help you there. Cor or Monica, any other thoughts on that? Yes, I really think if you can implement this proactive mindset in any industry, it will add a lot of value to your business. And it's really a communication tool that you can use, the methodology to, 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 to actually teach people to how do you become proactive in your thinking. And then you can actually can quantify that benefit going forward. And I think that's very important. And it gives you a tool to actively manage those controls that you've identified. Because I think often uh, you have so many things you want to focus on that you focus on nothing. So I think that for me is the value of this. Um, Monica. Monica, any your closing comments? My closing comment would be, uh, I love that it's a visual tool. I love that you can see it and that you can, I'm a visual person, so I like to see it and that you actually can take your management team through this on a visual basis and they can see where these controls sit um, and analyze them and understand them. I think it's, it's very Yeah, I, I agree. I, <clears throat> anytime I did these exercises in the past, they all want to see, <clears throat> management wants to see something visual. And the beauty mm -hmm. of this tool is that it really brings a bow tie to life, so to speak. <clears throat> Sorry, lose my voice right at the perfect time. Uh, so I, I really love this tool that you built and I encourage folks to reach out. And my closing comment is, you know, as I kicked it off, I, I really feel we're at a precipice here, uh, tipping point <clears throat> of where <clears throat> we've leaned out our, our supply chains <clears throat> we've leaned out our supply chain so much <clears throat> that <clears throat> we're getting a real test. <clears throat> Maybe I'll just stop talking <clears throat> and close out. I, my, my voice just went out. So with that, <clears throat> we uh, hope, thank you for joining. Please send in your questions and comments to uh, Cor and Monica. And uh, we look forward to your feedback and our second of a uh, series of webinars next year. Uh, and if we don't get a chance to speak before the new year, uh, all, all the best to each and every one of you. And thanks for joining so much. Thanks, Simone. Thank you.